Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather here together this morning. I ask that you send your Holy Spirit to attend the class that we're having, and that you be with Mark as he is heading out today, that you give him travel and protection. In Jesus' name, amen. Judges 20, verse 1. Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together. We're going to look at everywhere Dan the Beersheba was, Sister Christy. So this is the first one. Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. And Gilead means a rolling stones together as a witness, like a pillar, but if you take it down to its lowest definition and strong, it even includes repetition. So what would be way marks that are repeated? Line upon line? Okay, and they brought in a Mizpah. What's Mizpah? Where are they gathered together at? Miss Paul's the watchtower. So, Dan the Beersheba is talking about a gathering that takes place. And of course, one of the components of the 2520 is the gathering. And judgment and the seven times is Dan and Beersheba. And the land of Gilead is talking about line upon line, and Mizpah, the watchtower. So I'm going to argue that the end of Beersheba is a symbol of when the two sticks come together. This story here, real complex, but, and I don't know anyone that's got it figured out yet, but Judges 19 is a parallel to Genesis 19. Mm -hmm. Genesis 19 is... Sodom and Gomorrah, when the Sodomites want to take the two angels, and this is the story of the Levite and her, his concubine, when Benjamin rapes her to death, and then the Levite cuts her up in 12 pieces and sends her to all the tribes of Israel, and it brings all Israel together to punish Benjamin. So there's a separation there of, this, of the two sticks, and when it all gets resolved and they realize they don't want to eliminate one tribe fully, they don't want to kill Benjamin fully, there was one city that didn't come to the help of the Lord. So that city gets judged by them in a sense too because that city has to contribute their daughters to help repopulate Benjamin. And so it's, Sodom and Gomorrah is about the midnight cry. This is a parallel to, the, to Sodom and Gomorrah. It has something to do with the midnight cry and the, the unholy marriage. And in it, um, when you get to, ch to verse 1 of chapter 20, you got Dan and Beersheba. And I'm saying it's in the midnight cry period, from midnight cry to Sunday law, that the two sticks are joined together. And I'm arguing that Dan and Beersheba is a symbol of the two sticks joining together. And part of what takes place is a gathering. What's the next reference? 1 Samuel 3.20 1 Samuel 3.20 is teaching us if Dan de Beersheba is a symbol of the gathering of the two sticks from the midnight cry of the Sunday law. It's telling us Rowan, you want to read 19 to 21 and then Brittany, you want to read verse 1? This is 1 Samuel 3.20 First, First Samuel 3, verses 19 to 21. When Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, he did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Sister Brittany, verse 1. 
And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle, and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Ephraim. That's verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 3. Oh, I read verse 2. Oh, oh, okay. Um, chapter 3, verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So during the time period of the midnight cry to the Sunday law, you've got two options. The spirit of prophecy is restored from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, if Dan de Beersheba is a symbol of that history, and I'm pretty sure it is. Or you can simply say that that history we've already understood is where Elijah and the prophets of Baal have their confrontation, and Elijah is confirmed as the true prophet. Both of those ideas are in there, but in either case, the restoration of the spirit of prophecy from the midnight cry to the Sunday law during the joining of the two sticks is in this story of Samuel because when Samuel's first getting drawn into the ministry, the open vision, there wasn't any. But when he finally gets established as a prophet, everyone from Dan to Beersheba knew it. Everyone in the history of the Midnight Cry understood it. Next reference? Uh, 2 Samuel 3.10. 2 Samuel 3.10. Brother Chuck? 2 Samuel 3, verse 10. Yeah. And the Lord came and stood and called mm. as that other time. No. Second Samuel three ten. You in oh, first Samuel. Second Samuel, I'm sorry, in first Samuel. <laughs> to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan even to Bathsheba. Now, we know that Saul dies here, along with a lot of other people, at 9-11. But here, the horn of David buds out with the sprinkling of the latter rain. At the midnight cry, David's anointed the second time. Here he's anointed king over Judah. Here he's anointed king over Israel. And this passage is talking about the translation of the kingdom of Saul to the kingdom of David. And David's kingdom is established as a church triumphant at the Sunday Law. And how did it say? Uh, from Dan to Beersheba. From here to here, the two sticks are joined. And the, the kingdom of David, however you want to say it, Includes both sticks from the Sunday Law forward. Okay, next reference. Second Samuel seventeen eleven. That was Second Kings what? Seventeen eleven. Second Samuel seventeen eleven. Now, whose turn to read it? Laverne? Therefore I counsel that all Israel be generally gathered unto thee, from Dan even to Beersheba, as the sand that is by the sea for multitude, and that thou go to battle in thine own person. Okay. <coughs> this is a history of Absalom trying to overthrow David. Okay? And in this history, Absalom's getting counsel from how many false prophets? Now, and they may not be prophets, but he's getting counsel from how many bad counselors? Two. Two. Because this is the doubling. Okay? <coughs> you read it, he's getting counsel from two false prophets. And Absalom is the counterfeit of David. He's trying to take David's kingdom. And one of the, the false prophets is saying, if you do this, 
you will you'll unite from Dan to Beersheba, everyone. He's he's trying to counterfeit what David's about to receive. Okay, so you got to read the whole story to see all that, but it's there. Next one. Second Samuel twenty four two. Sister Kathy. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. What's going on in this history? Of course, what David's doing is he's sinning. But in this history, from, he's wanting to number the people from Dan to Beersheba. But what do we know about this history? What's one of the things that's happening? A draft. The num their number is being made up of the 144,000. There's a, nu a prophetic numbering going on. And when David is numbering the people, he's sinning, but it's associated with numbering the people from Dan to Beersheba. And is it okay for an opposite to typify? Yes. The opposite. Okay, this is his, his numbering is saying that there's a a numbering going on here. What we were just dealing with is 70. Oh, and it has to do with the same thing. He was drafting the Levites too, and that was his illegal part <coughs> that he was doing. Drafting the Levites. Which he shouldn't have done. He shouldn't have drafted anyone, but he definitely shouldn't have drafted the Levites. Okay, so Levites. It, this is, this is uh, where the Levites are being established, and part of his sin is that he's forcing the Levites to go into the military. So the, the Levites are an issue here too. But if you remember um, when the two sticks are getting story, joined together in the story of Joseph, remember that story? Okay, when Jacob come out of came, the promised land to go into Egypt, how many people came to end the process? Seven. Seventy. That seventy here the number has been completed. So there's a numbering that goes on in this history, a prophetic numbering. So this also is consistent with what we're saying about joining the two sticks. Um, next one. Second Samuel 24, 15. Um, this is probably more of the same. Mm -hmm. um, but let's read it. Because so the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. How many men were, were killed by this pestilence in this history? 70. 70,000. So the number of the night card in Sunday long on the scale of the number of the Sunday long. There's two numbers. There's a number in here of the 12 okay. and of the 70. But this is the completion of the first fruits. The first fruits got to get number. Right? Yeah. Everybody following the logic? The Dan of Beersheba is a symbol of the joining of the two sticks. Uh, next one, Sister Christie. First uh, Kings 4.24. And some of these will be repeats that we don't have to spend a great deal of time on. Brother Jim. <clears throat> for he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, for Tifsa even to Asa over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace on all sides round about him. That was First Kings four twenty four. Twenty five. Twenty five. Oh, okay. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, for Dan even to Beersheba all the days of Solomon. Okay, so. Who's Solomon? What, what's Solomon prophetically? Pardon me? That type of Christ, but in this history. Solomon is when the church triumphant is established. Solomon has just established his kingdom, right? And what did Solomon have to do to establish his kingdom? One of the things he had to do is he had to resolve four problems. Four problems. And those four problems were the problems of who? Of David. Okay, he, he had to deal with four men. So 
before his kingdom was fully established. Solomon is a symbol also of the church triumphant here, okay? Uh, because when he dedicates the temple, the, the, the Lord comes down, fills the temple with smoke. Okay, so you can place Solomon's kingdom here, but before his kingdom is established, he has to deal with, and I don't remember all their names, uh, four men that caused headaches for David before this takes place, and therefore he's illustrating that he had to deal with the sins of his fathers, which is the number four, and once they're in place, then the whole kingdom here is united, and the, the unified kingdom that Solomon represents is from Dan to Beersheba. It's the two sticks joined together. The church triumphant is in place. And, and we're just giving brief overviews. Go test it out. There's a whole lot of information in all these. There's only a couple more. Sister Christy? Um, First Chronicles 21-2. This is probably him is numbering the Numbering the people again. Okay, so we can pass by that one. Second Chronicles 30, verse 5. Uh, this is where I wanted to go. Second Chronicles 30, verse 5. We dealt with the, the next reference. Jump forward to the next reference. Amos 8, 14. We dealt with that yesterday. The sin of Samaria and... They said, thy God, thy, how's it go? Let, let's okay, read it. Let's, let's read it. And put 8.14. Someone have it? Amos 8.14. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. Okay, so I'm saying that that's the, the foolish virgins here that fall that are professing to be Adventists. They, they profess to believe in the judgment, they profess to believe in the, the pioneer understandings, though they don't, which this is Beersheba up here, the 2520. They swear by the sin of Samaria, which is the image <coughs> of the beast testing time, and they profess to be Adventists because Adventists believe they're the watchmen, don't they? Even... <coughs> All Adventists believe you're the watchman, supposedly. And what's Samaria mean? It's the watchtower. Okay. Pardon me, it's like Mizpah, but it's a different, it's like, it's another type of watchtower. So anyway, we dealt with this yesterday. That was the last reference to Dan the Beersheba, but we'll go back to 2 Chronicles 35. 30, verse 5. 30 and verse 5. And this is where I wanted to go. We haven't forgotten Ruth. Maybe you think we have, but we haven't. This is a real important one for a lot of levels. Is it Sister Madison's turn? Mm -hmm. So they established a decree to A what? A decree to Ah, there's a decree associated with this one. A decree. Go ahead. Proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. Okay, so well, the one thing I want to mark is that there's a message going from Beersheba to Dan and there's a decree. This is a, another reference for a decree at the midnight cry. Um, which we're suspecting is a subject of prophecy that the line of the tribe is opening up. But what are they doing here? In the Passover? Uh, uh, close, but no cigar. What are they doing here? <coughs> what has happened in the previous chapter, in chapter 29? Well, this is the Keeping the second Passover. This is the, uh, this is the second, second Passover. Passover. Yeah. Okay, in, in chapter 29... Uh, let's go back there. In chapter 29 of Second Chronicles, this is one flow of thought. thought. Um, let's start in verse 1. And Sister Christine, would you read the first five verses? And we'll do five verses each through chapter 29. And we'll skip over some. They're worth counting, but when we get down to a bunch of names from verses 12 through 14, we'll skip over them because of time. One through five. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, 
and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now wait a second. We're going to see as we read on that he opened the doors on the first day of the first month. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is 9-11, but read on. Um, and he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the East Street. What's getting gathered together in this history? The Levites. The priests and the Levites. And what street are they getting gathered into? The East Street. The, get, the gathering begins the day of the east wind. And how do you understand what the east wind is? You have to understand it using the pioneer logic. So you have to go back to the old pass. So they're gathered together on the east street, the old pass that identified the east wind. Go ahead. And said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. They're going to cleanse the sanctuary and the courtyard eight days each. <coughs> For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the sight of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. So, when do... Our fathers at 9-11, where do we see them turning their back? Revelation chapter 8. No, not Revelation chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8. They turn their back to the sun. They have a, they've, they've developed a character to worship the sun here. Okay, at 9-11, was there anything at 9-11 that marks that they've developed that character? Okay, Saul's went to the witch of Endor. They turned their back on the Lord. Go ahead. For our father... Oh, no, I read that one. Sorry. And they have shut up the, por the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing as ye see with your eyes. For lo... Our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity um, this, for this. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath, fierce wrath may turn away from us. Okay, so so when, do, when does the covenant relationship begin? 9-11 when we eat the little book. <laughs> and who's he dealing with? Jude Judah and Jerusalem. And Jerusalem. Um, there's one other thought in there. Uh, and they're in captivity. Okay, but I don't know if you've studied it out, but you can show that we're in a captivity. Adventist Church is in captivity here. When, uh, keep your finger there if you're not familiar with this. This is a big theme. This isn't only based upon this one passage, but you can see it real easy in this passage. Turn to Zechariah chapter 1. And uh, verse 12 says in Zechariah chapter 1, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years? So they were in captivity for seventy years. And verse 13 says, And the Lord answered the angel and talked with me with good and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy, and a very sore displeased with the heathen that are ease, where I was but a little displeased, and they have helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies, my house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. So, God's people are in captivity up to the point to when he's going to begin building Jerusalem. And when he's going to build Jerusalem, he's going to stretch a line upon it. And we know 
that at 9-11, the angel comes down, and in every reform line, when the angel or divine symbol comes down, what's, what work is accomplished then? Foundation. The foundation is laid. Okay, so this is the building of Jerusalem at the end of the world. And they're going to finish the temple when? Before the third way mark. The temple is finished. So this is, this is building Jerusalem. Begins at 9-11. God's people are in captivity before 9-11. Spiritual captivity, prophetically. Back to um, 2 Chronicles 29. Uh, I get who, who's who's turn to read. My, Michael's turn to read. <laughs> so I was going to skip over those names, but because you're you're good with names, you could probably move oh, through those I'm like a hot knife and warm butter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Eleven through fifteen. My sons, be not negligent. For the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that ye should minister unto him and burn incense. Okay, as he reads, and let's count how many there are here. Then the Levites arose, Mahath, and... No, no, and... No, Mahath, the son of Amasiah, and Joel, the son of Azariah, of the sons of the Kohathites, and of the sons of Merai, Merai, the uh, Merai, Kish, the son of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jehoiah, Jeh and of the Gershonites, Joah, the son of Zima, and Eden, the son of Joah, and of the sons of Eliah, Eli, Zephan, Shimri, and Jeel. And of the sons of Asaph, Zechariah, and Matzni, and of the sons of Heman, Jehiel, and Shimei, and of the sons of Jeduthun, Shimaiah, and, and Uziah. Uziah. How many sons, Fourteen. Sister Madison? Uh, you gave it away. <coughs> Sorry, you got lucky on that one. Fourteen. I don't, I'm not sure what that means, but go ahead. One more verse. Oh, and they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves and came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. So what are these? These are Levites, but they're probably a mixture of Levites and priests, right? And there's yeah, 14 cool. of them. Because a, a priest is a Levite. Well, they mentioned the Gohites. Gohanites. And that would mean that there were 12 Levites? Or anyway, that don't matter. Look, verse 16, Sister Tanya, 16 through 20. And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out and brought it into the brook Kidron. Now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the sixteenth day of the first month, they made an end. Let, let me do something here. Um, this is the first decree, the second decree, and the third decree. And the third decree goes into effect in 457. How many prophecies are there in the 2300 year prophecy? Five. Five. Okay, there, there, there may be some internal ones that are kind of... But anyway, five major ones. What's the first one? Trouble, uh, the streets and walls will be built. Yeah, well, how many, what's the prophecy? 70 weeks. Uh, oh, 70 weeks takes you down here. Seven. What's the first prophecy? Seven weeks. Seven, seven weeks. weeks. And how many years is seven weeks? And what happens in 49 years? The streets and walls are going to be built in troublous times. So when you see this, this is 49 years, okay? Let me break this out a little bit differently. First decree, second decree, third decree, then 49 years, and the first prophecy is done. <laughs> and it's accomplished by Nehemiah. 
And this is the 2300 year prophecy, right? <coughs> okay, but at a prophetic <coughs> level, if you add 1, 2, 3, and 49, you get to, if you're doing inclusive, how many days? 52. Inclusive. Begins in here, right? 51. 52, you're saying? Okay, so when Nehemiah came, done, did, came and did the work, how many days did it take for him to build the streets and the walls in troublous times? And what did he do before he began the work? Three days. He spent three days going around the city to understand what his work was to be. Unannounced. Unannounced, but and then what? How many days did it take to actually do the work? Forty-nine. Forty-nine days. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what I'm saying here, which is what I want you to see here. <coughs> This is a, this history here of the days, it actually takes place in here, but it, because the streets and walls are built before the end of the 49 years, but nevertheless it's a what, a fractal? It's a perfect fractal. It's a perfect fractal, all right? This is days, this is years, but only if you count these decrees as years, it's, it's prophetic. Do, do you see what, what I'm saying here? Okay, because you'll want to see that because I'm going to redo this. It's getting too busy. I'm redoing this. How many days where Tanya is reading, how many days is it going to take to cleanse the sanctuary? Eight days. Eight days. How many days to cleanse the courtyard. Eight days. Okay. And what when it's all cleansed, what is Hezekiah going to do? He's going to have a Passover. And when does the Passover begin? On the 14th day of the first month. And Passover is followed by the, the unleavened bread. And then the fruit feast of first fruits, which comes on the 16th day of the first month. And notice that in this history, it took them 16 days to do the cleansing. They actually start the cleansing, don't, don't miss it, back here on the first day of the first month. But it takes them to the 16th day, and he's going to have a Passover. Do you see the fractal in there? All right, because you want to see that. You want to see that from 9-11 to the Sunday Law, there's a twofold cleansing, but it's also illustrating the Passover. Right? Everyone follow that? Yes, no, maybe so. Why'd you throw the, you did an extra line and threw the first day of the first month back there? Doesn't it add up? No, I'm, uh, to the left of 9-11. Yes. Begins. We're placing this in our history at 9-11, first day of the first month, and showing 8 and 8 to take us to the 16th. But at the same time, Hezekiah is going to go back and observe the Passover. And the Passover begins on the 14th day of the first month followed by the Day of Unleavened Bread, followed by the First oh, Fruit see, Offering. Okay. I'm showing these two lines together because they're together in the story, and this story is about the Passover. When, when they, does Hezekiah keep the Passover on the first month? In this, in this chapter, does he keep it only in the second month? Only in the second month. Let's read it. <coughs> Yeah. Then they went to Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar burnt offerings with all the vessels thereof, and the shoe table and all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. Then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. 
Yeah. Sister Karen? And they brought seven bullocks and seven rams and seven lambs and seven goats for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary and for Judah. And he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. They, so they killed the bullocks, and the priest received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. <clears throat> Likewise, when they had killed the rams, they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They killed also the lambs, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And they brought forth the he-goats for the sin offering before the king and the con congregation, and they laid their hands upon them. And the priests killed them, and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalteries and with harps, according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet, for so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Yep. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priest with the trumpets. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. And all the congregation worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had made an end of offering, the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David and of Ash the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed their heads and worshipped. Then Hezekiah answered and said, Now we have consecrate now ye have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. So when is this taking place? It began on the first day of the first month. How long did it take to cleanse the sanctuary and the courtyard? Sixty days. So when did this worship celebration take place? Sunday. Yes, let's say the seventeenth. <laughs> and the, the, the music is a symbol of their experience, but the, it's past the time for them to have a Passover. If they were going to have a Passover, that time has passed. Um, verse 31, then Hezekiah answered and said, Now <clears throat> you have consecrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, as many as were of a free heart burnt offerings. And the number of the burnt offerings <coughs> the, which the congregation brought was three score and ten bullocks. How many is that? Seven. And a hundred rams and, a, and two hundred lambs. How many is that? Four hundred. That's three hundred. Rams and lambs. Three hundred is another number that fits in there right there with the seventy. <clears throat> That's Gideon's three hundred. All these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. And, they con the con and the consecrated things were six hundred oxen and three thousand sheep. Don't know about that one. But th the priests were too few, so they could not flay all the burnt offerings. Wherefore, their brethren, the Levites, did help them till the work was ended and until the other priests had sanctified themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. Mm -hmm. And also the burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. And Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people that God had prepared the people for the thing was done suddenly. Okay, so he's, he's put the house back in place, and now he's going to have a Passover, but he's going to do it. When's the Passover supposed to take place? 14th day of the first month. But when, when's he going to do it? In the second month. In the 14th day of the second month. And in Leviticus, it says it's okay to do that. Leviticus, that's the only feast I know of that you have an option of doing it in the first and the second month.
So what you need to understand is that the first Passover time period is for Adventism, and the second time Passover time period is for the eleventh hour workers, and we'll try to show you that here, and that and that this has to do with bringing the sticks together. Okay, so let's read the first five verses of chapter 30 now that we have the context. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem, and the thing pleased the king and all the congregation. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. Five more. So the post went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah, and according to the commandment of the king. Throughout all what? Israel and Judah. Was Israel and Judah already divided into two kingdoms in this history? Yep. So Hezekiah, the king of Judah, is inviting the divided kingdom to come and participate in this Passover. Um, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. Where are they going to come from? Out of Babylon. They're going to escape the hand of the king of the north. That's Daniel 11, verse 41. That's the Sunday law. This, this decree or invitation to come and keep Passover in the second month is the midnight cry. Right? Is it? It would be the... No, it would have to be Sunday law. No, it would be it's midnight cry. I'm, I'm just making well. it think it through because it's got to go from Dan to Beersheba. Yeah. This is the this is the awakening them to come to the Passover. If the Passover starts at the Sunday law, sending out a decree at that time, they don't get there on time. <coughs> Dan to Beersheba is the time period of the image of the beast test from the midnight cry to the Sunday law. The, they're hearing they're hearing of this and they're coming <coughs> right to inquire. This is this is a an argument. This isn't what I'm trying to deal with here. <coughs> but this is an argument. There's some kind of decree at the midnight cry. This goes along with our study on Esther and so on and so forth. So the, one, so the one hour workers are not included in this invitation? They are the ones that are being identified. So they're also reached out at the midnight cry? From the midnight cry to the Sunday law, what's happening in terms of agriculture? There's a plowing going on, and the plowing is the preparation. From this argument over the Sunday law, development of the Sunday law in the United States, the whole world is going to become familiar with the Sunday law issue in the United States in this time period. Everyone's going to look. And those with honest hearts that are still in the fallen churches of Babylon are going to come to understand the issue of Sabbath and Sunday. So when the Sunday law arrives, they are going to stand with God's people. They're going to come to this second Passover. There's a, there's a quote, I was dealing with this subject with a, a lady uh, last week, and there's a quote that Sister White has where she says that during this time, and she's, it's before the Sunday law, the doors are going to be opened. We're not going to be going and doing public evangelism, but the people are going to be flocking to the people who are giving the message. Um, so this, this well, the Sunday laws, well, the little laws, well, the, well, it's being agitated and all the little Sunday laws are taking place in all the states, um, the 11th hour workers are going to be right right there, inquiring of God's people. So, read on. Verse 7, And be not ye like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespass against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as ye see. Now be ye not stiff-necked. What were they given up to? Desolation. What's desolation? The seven what? Seven times. It's the 2520. Yeah. They were given up to the 2520. They were scattered. It's two sticks. Story of the two sticks coming together. Read on, Sister Brittany. Um, now ye 
Now be ye not stiff necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. And serve the Lord, God, the Lord your God, that the presence of his wrath be turned away from you. When is the sanctuary sanctified forever? I mean, God's <coughs> heavenly sanctuary has always and always will be sanctified, but in terms of prophecy, when is the sanctuary, the perfect fulfillment of the sanctuary being cleansed? Oh Sunday God. law. Close Sunday law. Not the close of probation. No, not the close of probation. The, the testimony is, is that the Sunday law, no more sinners will pass through her forever. They're, they're, at the Sunday law, the, the, the terrors of Adventism have been removed. And all the 11th hour workers that come in, they're righteous. They have the seal of God. And they're not in a, a sin and repent, sin and repent experience. This is the church triumphant from here on. The church triumphant, the story of the church triumphant, particularly in the spirit of prophecy, is that the difference between the church militant and the church triumphant is the church militant in this history has sweet and tares, but the church triumphant has no tares ever. So the people that are coming out of Babylon here, Prepared. They're prepared by watching this history here. Uh, that this is where they're. Anyway, that's that reference that is the sanctuary is sanctified forever. Is this is Sunday law? It's prepared for. But if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. <coughs> so the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh even to Zebulun. They laughed them to scorn and mocked them. What did they do? They mocked them. They mocked them. The mocking goes on in this history. Okay, so the, the decree that is calling them, if, if they're getting mocked for bringing this decree, to come to the second Passover, which we're saying is the Sunday law, when is this decree, when's this decree marked? It has to be, there's a decree at the midnight cry. With, isn't there another place where there's a mocking right there? Especially oh, there's all kinds of mockings. You take mockings and they're all, the, the, the Elijah right here is mocking the prophets of yeah. Baal. Um, <clears throat> Samson, in the story of Samson, Delilah, before she finally figures out how to bring him judgment, okay, by p putting out his eyes, there's Zedekiah at the Sunday law, before she figures it out, she's crying to Samson, you've been mocking me these three times, all right, the mocking here, when Lot goes to tell his sons-in-laws to get out of Sodom, the, he was as one that mocked them. What about Elijah? The, the 42 mocked Elijah and then he brings judgment upon them. The mocking is the midnight cry image of the beast time period. So this decree that goes forth to come to this, pa this second Passover is something that happens here that marks the arrival of the midnight cry. But we're trying to do it. We're trying to nail down for sure that the expression Dan de Beersheba is this history. This is Dan de Beersheba. It's the joining of the two sticks. Right? So... Go to Numbers chapter 9, and we'll see why it was okay for Hezekiah to have a Passover in this Numbers chapter 9 in the second month instead of the first month. What was the text? Chapter 9 um, of Numbers. Yeah, you can, you can do verse 10, but let's start and go to, start in verse 9 and go all the way to the end of the chapter. No, no, we've got to read the whole chapter. We have to read the whole chapter. You have to get to um, Who read last? Brittany read last. Do, do five for us. Five. Seven, nine. <coughs> yep. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, and the wilderness of Sinai, in the first month of the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, That the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. What's the appointed season? The fourteenth day of the first month. 
Oh, it's going to say that. Go ahead. Uh, in the fourteenth day of this month, at even, he shall keep it in it, his appointed season, according to all the rites of it, and according to all the ceremonies thereof, shall you keep it. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, that they should keep the Passover, and they, and they kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the first month, at even, in the wilderness, wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. Now here's what we want to see, verses 6 through 10, Sister Laverne. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of the man, that they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day. And those men said unto him, we are defiled by the dead body of the man. Wherefore are we kept back that we may not offer an offering of the Lord in his appointed season among the children of Israel? And Moses said unto them, Stand still, and I will hear what the Lord will command concerning you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto children of Israel, saying, If any man of you are of your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body or be in a journey of all off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord. So there was people that couldn't keep that Passover. Why? Because of the dead man's body. They touched death. But so when Moses asked, "Well, how do we handle this, Lord?" The Lord says, "Well, if there's anyone that has touched a dead body, or what else, Travel. 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 or took a long journey, then you can have a Passover in the second month, so they can partake of it." You see that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's two, there's two qualifications there. Yes. You, you dead body, or or a long journey. Okay, so let's read the next slide. So they were all defiled. They were defiled. They were, they, were, they were opened on the first day of the first month. They opened the doors of the sanctuary, and even the priests and the Levites were defiled. They all had to get sanctified, and they didn't get sanctified in time to have the first Passover, so they called the second Passover, and they invited all of even Israel to come. But you think that's where we're going. That's not where we're going. Let's step back and relax. Whose turn to read? Kathy. Kathy's. In the fourteenth day of the second month at even, they, keep, they shall keep it and eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it. According to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. But the man that is clean and is not in the journey or and forbears to keep the Passover, even the same soul, shall be cut off from among his people. Because if you're clean, you haven't touched any dead body, and you're there, and you don't keep the Passover, you die. You see that? You gotta keep that in your mind. <coughs> because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season that man shall bear his sin. And if a stranger shall, shall sojourn among you and will keep the Passover unto the Lord according to the ordinance of the Passover and according to the manner thereof, so shall he do. Ye shall have one ordinance both for the stranger and for him that was born in the land. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony, and at even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed. And in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. At the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord, and journeyed not. And so it was when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents, and according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And so it was when the cloud abode from even unto morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night, that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. 
And whether it were two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents. And at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And there's another place where this is emphasized in the writing to Moses. So when that cloud's there, you don't move. You stay in your tent. You don't journey. So when they're doing the first Passover, there's some people that had touched some dead bodies that needed to have a second Passover. But there wasn't anyone there that needed to have a second Passover because they journeyed, because the cloud had been there and they didn't have permission to journey. And if they would have journeyed when the cloud was there, what would they have done? They would have been cut off. They would have stoned them, all right? Yes? So at 9-11... Uh, can you explain that? Um, verse 13. Verse 13. But the man that is clean, he hasn't touched an unclean thing, and he hasn't been on a journey. But the man that is clean is not and, and is not in a journey, and forbeareth to keep the past very restrains himself from keeping the Passover. He forbeareth. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go to church this Sabbath because I, I don't feel like it. That's a, the attitude. He's got an attitude about this particular worship service. Even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season, that man shall bear his sin. It's a sin not to keep the Passover if you have if you haven't touched any dead body or if you're not on a journey. Yeah, he, he had no excuse for not being there. He hadn't touched a dead body. That would disqualify you from participating in the Passover. And he was there in the camp. So he had no excuse not in camp. He was clean. He was clean in terms of, of the requirement of the ritual. He should have participated in the Passover. And why, why are you going to go do the Passover? You're going to go make an offering to the Lord and confess your sins. Okay? It doesn't mean that because you're participating in the Passover, it means that you've got sins to confess. He's clean in terms of the, the legality of the, the law that allows him to participate. Um, I don't know if anyone else noticed this, but the word tarry, abode, and rested are interchangeable in this sense. So you receive the rest at 9-11 when the tearing time begins, when we're abiding under the cloud. Yes. I have a question. So on the second Passover, those that have already kept it on the first month were not required to do it again or were they supposed to join again on the second month and do it again? Don't know that. I don't know. Who read last? I did, but yeah. who? Jason. Jason. So Brother Jim, read Revelation 18, verse 1. And Sister Madison, read Revelation 10. Verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having, a, having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. That is 9-11, right? Everyone understands that. But 9-11 has been typified by the angel of Revelation 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was... Clothed with a what? Cloud. A cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head. And What's a rainbow a symbol of, Sister Matthew? Mm -hmm. The covenant. Go ahead. Okay. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. So it, when the angel of Revelation 10 came down, he brought a cloud with him. So when the angel of Revelation 18 came down, he brought a cloud with him. And when does the cloud move in the Millerite history? October 22, 1844. So where is the cloud in our history? From 9-11 to the Sunday Law, where is it? It's over the tabernacle, which means you don't go out doing public evangelism. So where is public evangelism represented in this Passover requirement? Go to Esther, chapter 1. Sister Tanya, your question? I wanted to point it out that on Numbers 9.15, the word appearance is actually the word mare. 
which kind of Mari also has to do with uh, Christ uh, appearing. So the connection between Revelation 18 and 10 and that. And I, I said Esther, didn't I? Mm -hmm. But I meant Ruth, didn't I? <laughs> We're dealing with Ruth. We done did Esther. For so long, it's in your mind still. <laughs> Um, read verses 1 and 2 for us. Uh, uh, chapter 1? Yes. Um, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a family in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elim Elimelech. 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 And the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Shilon, um, Euphratites of uh, Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Okay, so yesterday we were identifying that verses 1 and 2 is 9-11. So what's this guy do at 9-11? He's so generous. He takes a long trip when he shouldn't. The, the cloud came down, and he wasn't supposed to take a journey. Okay. And now, if he's going to take a journey, is his wife guilty of that sin if she submits to him? Yeah. No. 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 Or at least at the prophetic level, no, she's going to be, she's going to be a, a symbol of faithfulness. I see. But his two sons, what's going to happen because to them? Because she's required to submit to his judgment. Yeah, but she. Okay. So there's an issue of marriage here. But before we go there, keep your finger in Ruth and go to Revelation chapter three. What are you saying that means? We'll get, maybe this will help. Revelation chapter three. I, I went to Ruth too soon. Revelation chapter three verses. Is it one through six, Brother Tyler? What are you looking for? I'm looking, yes, 1 through 5, 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 3, 1 through 6. I'll read that. Please. I thought, I thought you were asking Please. what you were Please looking do. for. And under the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things say... Do you, you remember <laughs> what we defined Sardis as the other day? One of the definitions is those that escaped. And who is it that escapes the hand of the papacy? Yeah. Who are they? The eleventh hour workers. The eleventh hour workers are Sadisians. Right? Okay, so we're reading the message to Sardis. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that our that that thou livest and art dead. They're what? Yeah. Living ah, dead. they've touched some dead bodies, haven't they? So they can't be involved with the first Passover. They've got to be involved with the second Passover. Keep going. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to, de ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garment. How garments. do you defile your garment? By coming in contact with the dead. Coming in contact with the dead. Mm -hmm. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiments, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. When are the names getting blotted out? Yeah, judgment. Judgment. The judgment of the living. Okay, so there's a group of people, the Sardisians, which are 11th hour workers, that are associated with death and defiled garments. And they're going to get called to the second Passover. Now, what was your question? Um, Back to Ruth. Yeah, verse something about when she 
she's not accounted for, yeah. she's not really accounted for. Maybe I shouldn't say it that way. I think, well, I understood it the way that you said it, but if, if the husband has decided to do something, the wife is, she, is going along, well, I don't know. But she's going along with his decision according to what she believes is, you know, <clears throat> according to the Okay, law. yesterday we identified 9 11 as a, as a family. I don't know that we gave all, uh, some strong proof text of that other than we showed a famine here and a famine here and upon two witnesses and we can understand that this famine's at this way mark and this way mark. Um, but we have more evidence that there's a famine here. But where is, wh who is, what's his name? Abimelech? Yeah. Abimelech. Where, where is he from? Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem, Judah, which means celebrated. the house of celebrated bread. Yeah. Okay, I'm arguing that's the hidden manna. Mm -hmm. And what's the house? house. What's the house that, that is associated with the hidden manna? That house. is marked right here. It's the, it's the house of David. Oh, yeah. This is the raising up of the house of David. <laughs> it's the church militant getting transformed into the church triumphant. And so... Is there a famine at 9-11? Yes. <clears throat> the, 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 the hidden manna comes down out of heaven. It the water, the water dries, dries up. up. The water dries up. Mm -hmm. On the first day of the first month. Mm -hmm. The water dries up, at some, and that means what? The water is a symbol of no the Holy Spirit, of doctrine, and those who want the food or the, or the water, they, want it, they have to ask for it. So there's a there's a feast or a famine depending on how you relate to the to the circumstances. Five and five. Mm -hmm. It's going to be falling on hearts all around, but those who it's not falling on, they're in the famine. So who's Elimelech represent? The foolish. He's a, he's a foolish virgin. He doesn't understand. He thinks it's a famine when it's a feast, and he doesn't understand that the cloud came down, and what's he supposed to do? Tarry. Tarry. He's supposed to tarry till the cloud moves. The cloud moves here. When Christ moves into the most holy place, October 22nd, 1844, the clouds went from the holy to the most holy. That's typifying the Sunday law. The clouds move here. And at that point, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Elimelech doesn't understand he's supposed to stay in, the in his tent during this time period. And what's he do? He goes to Moab. What's Moab? That's public evangelism, right? Is that Edom, Moab, and Ammon are the Sardisians that escaped the hand of the papacy at the Sunday law. So he goes there, and what happens to him and his two sons that are going to get held accountable for this long journey? Okay, so they went on a long journey. Is, if you've been on a long journey, is that a qualification that you can come and celebrate the second Passover yes. yeah. was Naomi and Ruth on a long journey. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, but they're going to come back here to celebrate the second Passover. Who are they? Well, the eleventh hour workers. The eleventh hour workers, but Naomi. What are they? Who are they? Church. Their church. Their church. Just keep it as a, as a church. Ruth is a Moabite. <clears throat> that comes out at the Sunday Law and celebrates the second Passover, which is the Sunday Law, and she can do so why can, why, because she's been on a long journey. She, Ruth has her name changed from Ruth, in, no, and Naomi changed her name from Naomi to Mara, even better. So there's a change of name right as soon as uh, Naomi enters <coughs> her hometown. Okay, so when they get back, there's a name change. When, when would they get back? The Sunday law. At the Sunday law? I think well, midnight cry. They've got to get back at the midnight cry. Yeah. Why did they have to get back at the midnight cry? Because they hear that there's, there's, <coughs> there's <coughs> food in the land. They so they when do they hear that there's food in the land? <laughs> no, when do they hear that there's food in the land? <laughs> who hears that there's food in the land? Naomi and Ruth. No, who hears that there's food in the land? <laughs> oh, no. the 11th hour, or Sheba. No, who hears that there's food in the land? 
Oh, Joseph's brothers. Joseph's brothers. This is the joining of the two sticks. And when is when's the famine hit in the story of Joseph? Right here, at the midnight cry. And Joseph and his brothers hear that there's food in the land, and Naomi and Ruth, they hear that there's food in the land. They're marking here. This is the joining of the two sticks. Right? Mm -hmm. You see it? Um. So, f from the time they get back until, what is, what's his name? <coughs> oh, yeah. No, not Obed. What's his name? Her husband. Boaz. Boaz. Oh. What does Boaz do at the, the <coughs> gate? There's a gate here. He brings ten men. The ten, there's witnesses. He's got ten men. Okay, but what's he do? What, what does he do? He buys the land. He marries her. He the marriage the is right here at the gate. Well, actually, they, he buys the, the, the land and, the, and she comes with the land. Yeah, but it's but a, buying it's the a, land is a marriage. It's the marriage. Yeah. Yeah, it's the marriage. So before he marries her, before he goes and you know, does that ritual, you have her coming back and she's gleaning in here. And she also goes through the ritual of going in and laying down at his feet and uncovering his feet. Um, so we're saying that if she's changing her name at the midnight cry, is that a holy name change? Is the Lord entering into covenant at that point with those people? Or, or is this something she's just doing? Naomi, is, her name is changed here tomorrow. tomorrow. Naomi. Oh, um, to what? Mara. Is, is Mara marked at the midnight cry? Isn't it the same word for Mary? It's Mary. Mm -hmm. This is Mary, right here. This is where Mary comes and meets with Elizabeth, and they both have a prophecy, a double prophecy, Elizabeth and Mary. What, and so there's a covenant here <coughs> being marked. So when I've looked at it, I thought that... Uh, Ruth would be a, an example of the eleventh hour workers who come at the midnight cry because of the hearing. But then Naomi's an example of the seventy who come at the midnight cry, who are of God's church but have turned away to false apostate Protestant doctrines and have come back and and have, and are feeding on the true word again. So there, you have the symbol of those who are <clears throat> being the symbol of the Levites and the symbol of the eleventh hour workers, both at the same time coming right there at the midnight cry. Is that so? What are they? What are, I don't know. I don't know what you mean. One of them's one, and the other's the other. Naomi is the seventy. And yeah, yeah, at that level too. But one of them's the stick of Judah, and one of them's the stick yeah, right, of and Israel. Yeah, exactly. And they're, they're getting joined together in this history. And they show that. And, uh, yeah. What I what I wish that at some point in time the Lord will reveal it to someone, and I, I hope I get to hear it. There's something about the ritual that she does going into his, where he's sleeping after he's been separating the grain and uncovering his feet and laying down at his feet. There's something about that ritual that is illustrating the image of the beast of midnight cry time period. I can't figure that one out at all. Do you know what it sounds like to me, that ritual? It sounds like Mordecai telling Esther to take a risk because Naomi told Oh yeah, it's a test. It's but it's a risk that she was taking. I mean, if he had rejected her, it's that same risk. But Naomi representing Mordecai because that was the advice that. Yeah, she's taking the advice of, of Naomi Mordecai. of Mordecai. And doing a risk. And going into her to the husband, her but potential he husband. But what are the two bare feet, and the covering? And what's it mean that he gives her, what, six ephahs of grain or whatever it is? There's something in there that fits this story, fits this time frame. But when he marries her, there's ten witnesses. Who's the ten witnesses? Ten kings. Ten kings. The United States has fallen, and now it's about the kingdom of the ten kings. Um, I, when we started reading Ruth uh, today, were, are you contrasting the marriage between Elimelech and Naomi with... No, what I was saying about Elimelech <coughs> is that we're placing, we're, we're arguing that verses, verse 1 of Ruth is 9-11. So Elimelech, he thinks there's a famine and he goes to Moab. So he's representing someone that took a long journey 
when he wasn't supposed to. He's in, he's in disobedience. The cloud came down here. He was a Hebrew. He was supposed to stay here. But he decided to take his wife, his two sons and their two wives, and go to Moab. He'd go do public evangelism. He dies. So do his sons die. That was disobedient. Disobedience. But then at the secondary level, level the wives... No, he didn't bring them. He, he didn't they bring picked them up in Moab. Yeah, okay, they picked them up in Moab. So, and what do you see in the two daughters in Moab? Wise and foolish. You see, you see a wise and foolish. You see a purification process of the 11th hour workers. One class decides to stay in Moab and the other follows Naomi home. So what I'm saying about the reason that I took the time to go in and look at the second Passover. The second Passover is the Sunday law. It's for Sardis. It's for people that have been on a long journey. They've been separated from the stick of Judah for a very long time. And the Sardesians are, they have a name that they're living, living but they are dead. They've been <coughs> defiled by dead bodies. So they have to come to this, uh, this second Passover. And what I'm saying is that Elimelech, is that how you say it? Yeah. He, he was supposed to stay here. Whether he thought there was a famine or not, because at 9-11, the cloud comes down, he's supposed to stay in his tent, and he's in rebellion. He, he goes to do public evangelism, and he dies. I have a question about the Sardisians, because in the study Bible it says, Who is so favored as to be numbered among these few in Sardis? Are you, am I, who are among this number? It is not best for us to inquire into this matter in order that we may learn to whom the Lord refers when he says, The few that have not seen their white robes of character. So why would he specifically mark at that time that we're not supposed to be inquiring about who the Sardisians are? I wonder why. Because we're, well, not, all supposed to, we're not supposed to be inquiring about who the 144,000 are at that same time. This is specific though. When it, at the end of the context you just read, it says that you're not to inquire and for, for this specific reason, who has a white robe and who doesn't. If That's what number, you're though, who among the number? Yeah, yeah who are among the number okay. who don't have the white robe or do have the white robe? We're not. It, that's the same. Is that thing. what it says? Who have the white robe and who don't have the white robe? Very last sentence. Who have not stained their white robes of character? Yeah. We're also uh, told okay. not to. We're not to say who the tares and who the wheat. Who's wearing, wearing a white garment? That's who's not? But it, it, what I'm saying is, it's it's curious that the issue about the one of the issues about the people in Sardis is the white robe because who's given white robe? The martyrs under the under the fifth seal, the the great multitude is given white robes, and the eleventh hour workers are the great multitude. But that's a different story. So let let's end it there. All we got through is two verses in Ruth. But what we're saying is is that Elimelech he wasn't supposed to take sickly and desolation to Moab. He was supposed to stay in his tent. Sickly and desolation being the health message and Chilion and Maon. Okay. And and um, it says in verse twenty two that Na when when did Naomi return? <coughs> At the beginning of the barley harvest. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if you want to line the barley ho harvest up with the feast, and insist that the the um, pardon me, it, you'd have to you got to bring the first fruit offering in on on this day, on the sixteenth day. It means you got to cut it down before that. But it, this isn't being specific. It's at the beginning of the barley harvest. It's in this time frame here. But it's definitely after the Passover. Is it? Yeah, because it's the beginning of the barley barley harvest, so you're already assuming. I don't know. No, you no, you, you would you would have to have it gathered here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because you, you got to bring it to. to what day of the week did Christ die? Friday. Friday. Right. Okay. So you're not going to be cutting down your barley on Friday night. He's going to rest in the tomb on Sabbath. You're not going to be cutting it down then. And you've got to bring the offering on the 16th. You're, you're doing it in here somewhere. 
At least that's what logic says. Sister Brittany? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for the class that we just had. Um, I praise you for the light that you're showing us and I ask that you continue to tarry with us and allow us to perfect our characters. Pray now that you be with us throughout um, our day and be with us in our work. Allow us to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.